Hannibal by Ernel Bradford. 12. Tresamine. Eager to press home his advantage, Hannibal would have liked to attempt the passage of the Apennines immediately, but the increasing severity of the weather and the poor health of his own troops were against him. Furthermore, he now had to contend with the Gallic temperament, and the Gauls did not reckon that a victory was followed by further action, but by plunder and enjoyment. It was a factor that Hannibal would have to bear in mind for the future. For the moment he gave them, as well as his own troops, free reign to ransack the lands around, and the Romans were given no place even in their winter quarters. Livy tells us that the garrison towns of Placentia and Cremona, housing the survivors of the legions, were completely cut off from local supplies, and could only be maintained by ferrying all their requirements up the Po in barges. In Rome itself, now that the real situation was evident, there was such consternation that people looked for the immediate appearance of the hostile army before their very city, and knew not which way to turn for any hope or help in defending their gates and walls against its onset. The arrival in Rome of Sempronius, who had made his way back with great hazard through countryside and was dominated by Hannibal's cavalry, facilitated the election of the new consuls for the year 217 BC. Gaius Flaminius and Gnaeus Servilius were the consuls chosen, the former for the second time. He was a man who had won great popularity with the people for his hostile attitude towards the Senate and the aristocratic party. He had also a high opinion of his military prowess from a previous campaign against the Gauls. While Servilius was to command the legions which would be based on or Riminum, to Flaminius, fell the welcome task of taking over the troops of Eritium, Arezzo, where he would be seen to be barring the passage of the invader towards Rome. Since both existing consular armies had been decimated at Trebia, four new legions were immediately levied, an early sign that the manpower of Italy would prove its greatest asset. Before all the operations for that year ceased, Hannibal, despite a wound incurred in a cavalry action, had captured the large trading post of Victumuli. Here he had been met by a hostile Gallic population who had tried to oppose his attack on their township. They were rooted and then exterminated for their faithfulness to Rome. It was vital in this early stage in the war that the Gauls of northern Italy should realize from the start that fortune and freedom lay in joining the Carthaginian, but that he was more merciless than the Romans if opposed. Hannibal's personal relations with the Gauls who joined his army now and there later and later in his campaigns were all important for his success in Italy. What he promised them, as he did his own men who had followed him from Spain, was complete freedom and the right by conquest to the lands that they made theirs, since the lives of Gallic warriors at the time revolved around warfare, usually against their fellow Gauls and they had hardly attained the settled ways of the Italians, who were agriculturalists first and foremost, the appeal of battle and plunder was irresistible. They asked for nothing more, believing that to die in battle was the proper thing for a man, 
and that their spirits would in any case survive. Their outlook on life was, in a sense, Homeric, and in almost all respects they resembled the Norsemen of later centuries, feasting and drinking wine, boasting of their exploits, listening to tales of heroism from their bairns. They were brave and simple children. Gold torques and heavy wrist and armbands of gold showed their wealth. Their unarmored bodies displayed their contempt for the enemy, until trained into Carthaginian and Roman usage of corselets. And they went trousered through the world, unlike the men of the Mediterranean, who saw in the long leggings of the north the mark of the savage. The historian Diodorus writes of them that they would happily engage in single combat with one another over trivial incidents at their drinking parties, and that they were fond of songs about the great deeds of their ancestors. They enlarged the bronze helmets that they wear with horns to give an appearance of great size. They carry shields as long as their bodies, embossed with the bronze head of some beast. They speak in riddles, hinting darkly at their meaning, while always extolling themselves. Terrible in aspect, they appear threatening, yet they have sharp wits and are often clever in learning. These were the men who were to form the bulk of Hannibal's army for many years, and these were the men whom he had above all to impress, not only with his superior intelligence and cunning, not only with a braver, bravery that would equal theirs on the battlefield, but with some quality that seemed to set him apart from other human beings. As a cultured man, and as a Carthaginian noble, sprung from generations of rich and noble men, he was accustomed to the ways in which the simple may be impressed and overwrought. Among his personal staff was a Carthaginian priest and soothsayer, and Hannibal must have been conversant and Hannibal must have been conversant with the skills with which the priesthood worked upon the superstitious of the ignorant. Polybius, almost certainly quoting some earlier and contemporary authority, tells us that it was during this winter that he also adopted a truly Punic artifice, fearing the ficklessness of the Celts and possible attempts on his life owing to his establishment of friendly relations with them being so very recent, he had a number of wigs made dyed to suit the appearance of persons differing widely in age, and kept constantly changing them, at the same time also dressing in a style that suited the wig, so that not only those who had seen him but for a moment, but even his familiars found difficulty in recognizing him. Hannibal had, indeed, good reason to fear an attempt upon his life, for during his few months in Italy he had already been responsible for the death of many Gauls. Among the Turinine, among the Torini, prior to the Battle of Trebia, and recently at Victumulae, and he knew how the code of the blood feud operated among them. Remember the fate of his brother-in-law, Hasdrubal, assassinated in Spain for some unspecified grudge? His recent wound may well have served to remind him that it was upon him and him alone that the success of the war against Rome depended. Not only Hasdrubal, but also his father, Hamilcar, killed in battle, and died before they could work out the great oath that they had taken upon the altar to wreak vengeance upon Rome for her perfidious treatment of Carthage. Many thousands had already fallen in pursuance of that oath, and it was clear to Hannibal that by his hand upon the sacrificial offering not only had he committed himself, but also without him the Carthaginian cause was doomed. <laughs>
The news from Spain was bad. Under the attack of the Roman legions, commanded by the brother of the consul Scipio, the Carthaginian forces in northern Spain had been defeated. Most of the region between the Pyrenees and the Ebro was now in Roman hands, with the result that, contrary to his hopes and expectations, he could no longer be reinforced overland by the way that he had come. For, come. Furthermore, the Romans, putting to use their command of the sea, had thwarted the Carthaginian attempt to land reinforcements near Pisa. Hannibal's communications were efficiently strangled, and, although his first onslaught on Italy had proved successful, the long-term Roman strategy of reducing the Carthaginian source of power, Spain, and, the, and of denying him assistance by sea was already bearing fruit. Rome, wrote William O'Connor Morris, was a great nation, Carthage, an ill-governed state, and the truth of those words would become increasingly apparent as the years went by. Hannibal had no other sure source of reserves but the Gauls of Italy. He was dependent upon them, and the whole success of the expedition was dependent upon him staying alive. His hopes at this time must also have been geared to the possibility of seducing away from Rome the Latin allies, who, in many respects, formed the bulk of her armies. If he could shatter the confederation that held these states together, he could deprive Rome of a principal source of manpower and isolate her. For this reason, both now and in the future, he was careful to make a distinction among the prisoners that he took. Romans were reduced to slave status, but the Allies were treated kindly, and, whenever possible, sent back to their homes with the message that the Carthaginian had no enmity against them. His war was against Rome. Early in the spring, well aware that the Gauls were restive and that they were eager to leave their own territory and live off the land of their enemy, Hannibal gave the order for the army to move south into Etruria. Knowing that the eastern route by Ariminum on the Adriatic coast would be guarded by two consular legions, and having no doubt found out that the other main force awaited him on the western flank of the Apennines at Eretium, he decided to take a route which the Romans would not have anticipated. The way that he chose was more direct, but its disadvantages would become apparent only too soon. It seems likely that having marched as far as Bologna, he then turned west, crossing the Apennines by the Peso Colina, to come out near Pistoia, he emerged into the valley of the Lower Arno, an area at that time undrained and marshy in the extreme. The order of the army on the march, as given by Polybius, is interesting since it shows what reliance he placed upon the various national units. In the van went the Africans and the Spaniards, and all the more disciplined troops, the baggage train being interspersed among them. Behind, forming the main body, came his thousands of Gauls, and in the rear came the cavalry, both heavy and light, ready for action, if any attempts were made to harass the army, and forming also a formidable warning to any Gauls who might think of deserting it if the going got difficult. The crossing of the marshes of the Lower Arno was almost as hard upon the troops, in its quite different way, as had been the later stages of the Alps. All the army, says Polybius, suffered much, chiefly from lack of sleep, as they had to march through water for three continuous days and nights. The Celts were much more worn out, and lost more men than the rest. Most of the pack animals fell, and 
perished in the mud, the only service they rendered being that when they fell, the men piled their packs on their bodies and lay upon them, being thus out of the water and enabled to snatch a little sleep during the night. Many of the horses also lost their hooves through the continuous march in the mud. Only one elephant now survived out of the 37 with which he had crossed the Alps. This was written by Hannibal himself in the passage through the marshes. This was possibly the one Indian elephant in the troop since the elder Cato referred to the survivor as Surus, the Syrian. The Indian elephants used in ancient warfare came from Syria. Livy paints an even harsher picture of the plight of the invading army than Polybius, but both confirm that it was here that Hannibal suffered a severe misfortune. Hannibal himself, whose eyes were suffering in the first place from the trying spring weather, alternating between hot and cold, rode upon the sole surviving elephant that he might be higher above the water, but lack of sleep damp nights and the air of the marshes affected his head and since he had neither place nor time for employing remedies he lost the sight of one of his eyes juvenal later refers to him as the one-eyed commander perched on his monstrous beast whatever he and his men had suffered in these days through the marshes of the arno valley was redeemed by the immense tactical advantage that he had stolen over the enemy. Far to the east of them, Servilius and his troops watched the roads and passes on the Adriatic side of Italy, while to the south, Flaminius waited at Eretium to bar the road of Rome to Rome. Hannibal had no intention of meeting the enemy on a field of the latter's choosing, and not of his own. He intended to bypass Flaminius, and carry straight on towards the center plains of Italy. His troops had asked for rapine and plunder, and to live off the land of their enemy, and he was leading them directly into the rich plains of Tuscany, the desired treasure land of many armies in the centuries to come, rich in grain and cattle. The smiling land of ancient Etruria yielded up its villages, its animals, and its crops to the furious horde that locust-like moved easily through it in the warm days of spring. Hannibal was well aware that Flaminius, left high and dry at Erectium, would be tortured at the reports reaching him of these depredations. Flaminius had set himself on the road to Rome like the champion of the city and had been ignored. He must also have been aware of the political danger to Rome arising from Hannibal's apparently uncontested march of success. The Etruscans, former masters of the land, had always resented the dominance of the city, which they had fought so long and so hard, and they might consider this Phoenician descendant as nearer to them in blood and culture than the Romans. Hannibal dragged the lure in front of his opponent, and Flaminius rose to the bait. Although a number of his officers strongly advised him not to attack until he had been joined by his fellow consul and his forces, Flaminius broke up his camp and set off in pursuit of Hannibal, utterly regardless of time or place, but bent only on falling in with the enemy. Like Sempronius before him, he wished to be seen as sole champion and defender of Rome, and, even if this side of his nature had not played its part, he, as the consul nearest the invader, could hardly allow this public humiliation of Roman arms to continue any longer. Hannibal must soon have heard the news that the Roman army was on the march, and permitted himself the luxury of a smile. Calmly and confidently, he trailed his forces past the ancient city of Cortona to 
his self to his left and moved towards Lake Trasimene on his right. Like many other sites of ancient battles, the area around Lake, Lake Trasimene has changed considerably over the centuries. A small flat plain to the north of the lake surrounding the river Masseron is largely the result of alluvial deposit, as well as a deliberate lowering of the level of the lake in the 15th century, and did not exist in Hannibal's time. The way by which Hannibal approached the lake was by the defile of Borgato, Malpazzo, as it is appropriately called, with the great misty surface of the Trasimene and its two islets, Isola Minora and Isola Maggiore, lying mirrored in the waters on its right hand. To the left of him, as the army came into what was then a small basin, the valley of the river, the hills bulked up all around in the shape of a U, barren or scrub, and Cistus tangled. Today, the hills most certainly held thicker coverage at one time. Once, through the narrow entrance by Malpasso, a bottleneck with the water on one side and slopes on the other, Hannibal could see ahead the long, conspicuous ridge where the valley of Tuaro lies. Here, readily and immediately visible to the Romans as they entered through Malpasso, he would station a prominent part of the army. At Trebia, he had had to use some ingenuity to make the land work for him, but at Tresemene, nature had prepared a trap designed for slaughter. Like the last chamber into which the great tunny fish are driven, the Camera della Morte, the lake shore, provided the bottom and the hills to west, north, and east, the enclosing sides. East, then, on the long ridge, Hannibal sighted his best troops, the Africans and Spaniards, drawn up formally with the standards and banners. They would at once proclaim to the consul, as he came through the defile, that Hannibal had arranged his army for a set-piece battle, taking advantage of the fact that the legions would have to advance up a slope to attack. The Romans would not shirk that, and Flaminius, with his eagerness to get at the enemy, would not let the unfavorable approach deter him. On the western slopes, which ran down towards the lake, and which would be on the left flank of the Romans once they had entered the basin, of the Maceroni, Hannibal stationed the Gauls and the Carthaginian heavy cavalry, and on the east, in an extended line, on flat ground, below the hills, he stationed his light troops, the slingers and pikemen. All was set. All that remained was for the long body of the Roman army to insinuate itself through Malpazzo, and then Hannibal, after waiting until they were all in place, would close the door. The Gauls and cavalry would drop down the slopes on their left and seal off the road behind them. That night, Flaminius and the head of the Roman column reached the lake and encamped to the west outside Malpazzo. They had been followed close on Hannibal's heels, and they knew that he must be quartered not far away. Somewhere ahead, perhaps on the far side of his neck of the great lake. They waited for the dawn. It was a very misty morning, not so rare in spring, the damp air rising off and hiding the lake, and lying thick over the river valley, eager to get to grips with the Carthaginian before he could move on further towards Rome. Flaminius gave the order for the advance, Hannibal waited until the first of the consul's troops were in contract, 
with his own men, stationed below the main body of his army. Then the trumpets blared out, brazen and ominous, through the mist. From the western slopes near Malpaso, north as far as the village of San Guineto, the Gauls and the heavy cavalry came thundering down, taking the legions on their left flank and closing the passage behind them. To quote Livy, their onset was all the more sudden and unforeseen inasmuch as the mist from the lake lay less thickly on the heights than on the plain, and the attacking columns had been clearly visible to one another from the various hills, and had therefore delivered their charge at nearly the same instant. Held in front and taken from flank and rear, the consular army had not even time to take up battle order when the waves of attackers hit them. The lake on the right gradually emerging luminous and still as the sun rose gave the legions no promise of hope. Though the wavering mist, the wild gulls, the heavy cavalry, and the gadfly, Numidians, came charging in again and again. The Romans were killed where they stood or forced back, step by reluctant step, towards the shallow margins of the lake. All order, that disciplined order upon which the yeoman soldierly, soldiery of Rome relied for their strength, was lost, or never seen asserted. So sudden had been the attack, while the advance ranks, true to the stubborn courage which distinguished the Romans, fought their way steadily up the slopes towards the Carthaginian camp. The main body of the army and the rear were cut down in swathes. It was, it was no ordered battle, writes Livy, with the troops marshaled in triple line, nor did the vanguard fight before the standards, and the rest of the army behind them, neither did each soldier keep to his proper legion cohort and maniple. It was chance that grouped them, and every man's own valor assigned him his post in van or rear. And such was the frenzy of their eagerness, and so absorbed were they in fighting, that an earthquake violent enough to overthrow large portions of many of the towns of Italy, turn swift streams from their courses, carry the sea up rivers, and bring down mountains with great landslides, was not even felt by any of the combatants. For three hours the battle raged in that small U-shaped stretch of land to the north of Lake Trasimene. Polybius with memoirs. Polybius with memories, no doubt, of ancient Greece in his mind, the Spartans at Thermopylae, perhaps, records with fitting words the destruction of the Roman army. So there fell in the valley about 15,000 of the Romans, unable either to yield to circumstances or to achieve anything, but deeming it as they had been brought up to do, their supreme duty not to fly or quit the ranks. The consul himself was killed by the insubrian Gaul, who recognized him from his armor, and, remembering Flaminius's campaign against his fellows, took his revenge upon the man who had devastated his homeland. The remnants of the decimated army, driven inexorably back before the onrush of Africans, Spaniards, and Gauls, were massacred at the edge, or in the very waters of the lake. Some six thousand men, who had been in the vanguard, fought their way out of the trap and made their way to high ground, where they were able to see, as the mist lifted, the utter devastation of Roman arms. The following day they were rounded up and captured by the Numidian horse under their leader, Maharbal. Hannibal, courteous as always in the rituals of war, ordered a search to be made for the body of Flaminius in order to give it decent burial, but doubtless already stripped of his distinguishing army armor, the consul was never found.
15,000 Romans and their allies died in the Battle of Lake Trasimene, and a similar number were taken prisoner. The Carthaginians lost 1,500, one-tenth of the enemy, mostly Gauls. True to his political aim of upsetting the allegiance of the Allies with Rome, Hannibal sent the former to their homes with the message that his war was not against them, but only against the Romans. The latter were distributed among the army as prisoners and slaves. The Battle of Lake Trasimene was the greatest reversal of Roman arms that had yet occurred. So absolute was it, and coming so soon after their defeat at the river Trebia, that when the news of the disaster reached Rome, it could in no way be concealed. As the first rumors spread throughout the city, the people swarmed, like ants whose nest has been callously disturbed around the main public buildings. The praetor, the senior Roman magistrate, a dignified figure, respected above all partisan politics, consulted with the Senate and summoned a meeting of the commons. There has been a great battle, he said. We have been defeated. Thirteen. A pause for thought. The spring of 217 BC, which had begun for Hannibal with what seemed near disaster in the swampy marshland around the Arno, had turned into a triumph. It was one that was engineered by his willingness to take the risk of approaching Etruria by an unexpected route, and then by his military genius at Lake Trasimene. This new victory was to be followed up by a further blow to Rome, when an advance force of 4,000 horse, sent ahead by the other consul, Servilius, was met by Maharbal and the Carthaginian cavalry. The Romans had just crossed the Apennines and emerged into Umbria when they were sighted by Maharbal, who was scouting ahead of the main body of Hannibal's army. In the ensuing battle, all the Romans were either killed or captured, thus depriving Servilius of his scouting force as well as an essential part of his army. Since Servilius could no longer safely move his legions, Rome was to all intents and purposes deprived of both her consular armies and left defenseless. No longer able to communicate with the surviving consul, for no one knew where the army or, or the cavalry of Hannibal was from one day to the next, the news of this further disaster reduced Rome to a state of deepest shock. Yet it is interesting to note that even at this moment, despair did not enter into the Roman consciousness. Defeat was so little known to them, and for so long had they been masters of their chosen battlefields, that, as the historians confirm, they do not seem to have realized the full danger of their position. Other states at the period of that period of history only needed one major defeat on the battlefield to abandon hope and sue for peace. The Romans, however, did realize that the situation called for a drastic change in the Constitution. They did what had never been done until that day writes Livy, and created a dictator by popular election. Their choice fell on Quintus Fabius Maximus and Marcus Minucius Rufus. They made master of the house. 
To them the Senate entrusted the task of strengthening the walls and towers of the city, of deposing its defenses, as seemed good to them, and of breaking down the bridges over the rivers, the Anio and the Tiber. They would have to fight for their city and their homes, since they had not been able to save Italy. Hannibal was now the undisputed master of the land, free to ravage the Roman Rome wherever the inclination took him. But his army, reconstituted though it was, remained an army of conquest, with no capacity for conducting siege warfare. He had no siege train, with its storming towers, its battering rams, and its catapults, nor indeed any technicians for the kind of work, all of which were essential in order to reduce cities and garrisons and hold down a countryside. Already, at what seemed a point of triumph, the essential weakness of Hannibal's position was made clear. He could conquer, but not consolidate. But the greatest weakness of the Carthaginian lay in his lack of a political aim of any consequence. His immediate political aim was to seduce Rome. His immediate political aim was to seduce from Rome the allies within her confederacy, restoring to them their freedom. But freedom for what? They had known the advantage of living under Roman rule and law, and they were hardly likely to put these aside in order to return to the condition of something like the old Greek city-states. Hannibal was not proposing that Carthage should take over the dominant rule now held by Rome and substitute Carthaginian laws, manners, and financial control. His ultimate aim, it would seem, was no more than a return to the status quo before the First Punic War. If Rome and her allies and dependencies were content to stay within the sphere of Italy, even conceding Sicily to them, then all would be well. Carthage would continue trading throughout the Mediterranean and elsewhere, and the Mediterranean would carry on snugly divided into Carthaginian and Roman spheres of influence. One may sympathize with Hannibal, but the lesson of history, if there is one, is that one cannot go back. The world before the First Punic War, the world that his father, Hamilcar, had remembered and had pledged him to make new again, was far lost and gone. The collapse of Greece in the East and the decadence of the Greek states that had come under the control of Alexander's generals and their successors had left a power vacuum that must one day be filled. The very lack of territorial ambition on the part of Carthage, her lack of manpower in itself, meant that the energetic and expanding power of Rome would ultimately fill it. The man who was chosen to act as dictator and rally Rome and the Latin allies at this hour of need was a Roman of the old type, one of those whose clean-shaven, tough faces stare out from many a bus depicting the men of the Republic, Quintus Fabius Maximus, to be nicknamed from his caution, Cunctator, the Delaire, was to prove the right man at the right time. Unlike the consuls, he was tied to no term of office, and he had no name to make. The family of Fabius was so well established in the history of Rome that it would have been difficult for an individual to have added to its luster. Descended from Fabius Verbolanus, who had on three occasions been made consul in the 5th century BC, despite the fact that he had opposed the patricians, the Fabius, who was elected to the supreme office to oppose Hannibal, was a man who could command the support of the old aristocratic families as well as the populace. Conservative by nature, 
Fabius was the first to appreciate that the Romans had been neglecting a number of religious ceremonies, and that others had been incorrectly performed. He made sure that in all respects the divine element was not neglected, thereby to a great extent restoring the morale of the citizens, while his practical efforts to ensure the defense of the city reassured both the religious and the pragmatic. Fabius expected Hannibal to march on Rome, and concentrated his efforts on preparing the city and its citizens for such an event, but he may have been aware that the Carthaginian did not yet have a siege train with which to invest the capital. The non-appearance of his enemy may have suggested that the latter was away preparing his troops and making the mechanical and technical preparations necessary for the siege. Fabius had time, meanwhile, to consider his approach to the Carthaginian general who had invaded Italy, something no one had thought possible, and who had already displayed an aptitude for warfare that had shown up harshly the deficiencies of the republic, republican system. Fabius, as defender of the land, had time on his hands, and he also had manpower. He took over the two legions of the consul, Gnaeus Servilius, and added a further two legions to the army that now lay at his disposal. At the same time, he gave orders for all the people who lay ahead of Hannibal's line of march to abandon their farms, burn the buildings, and destroy the crops. Centuries later, his basic strategy was to be adopted by the Russian general Kutasov against Napoleon. The people of Italy should withdraw into their land, leaving as little behind them as possible, and he himself, as commander of the only organized army, should avoid a pitched battle at any cost. Guerrilla tactics, harassing the flanks of the enemy, cutting off his foraging parties, and gradually bleeding the invader to death, were the methods that Fabius was to employ against the general, whom, very wisely, he was unwilling to meet on normal terms. The one thing that Fabius had to do, he realized, was avoid defeat. The victory that he must aim for was not the traditional one upon the battlefield, something that the genius of his opponent rendered unlikely, but success achieved over a very long period of time, if need be. The presence of his troops must be used to reassure the Allies and their cities that Rome was watching over them. Time and the extent of the land itself must be made to work for him. The Carthaginians' army must be reduced slowly, its moral sapped, and its opportunities for engaging him in a straightforward battle reduced to the minimum. Hannibal had decided against an attempt on Rome itself, and had moved his troops through Umbria and Picanum to the east, eastern coast of Italy. His army, laden with booty and driven and driving cattle before them, reached the Adriatic and settled down to enjoy the fruits of their success, while Hannibal waited for the climate and the good living to restore the health of men who had endured a hard winter, and then being taxed to the utmost through swamps of the Arno, and had finally gone on to win a great and decisive victory. Among their spoils were arms and armor captured at Tresemine, and he began to re-equip his own men and the Gauls, training the latter in the use of the new arms, and trying to instill into them some of the discipline of the professional soldier. The scorbutic disorders of the troops were relieved by fresh fruit and oil, while the horses which had been suffering from mange, were restored by good fodder and by alcohol, wine rubs. While the horses grew glossy and the tired men strong and healthy, he sent messengers by sea, possibly using vessels captured on the coast, to report on the state of affairs to Carthage. At no time 
did he make the mistake of thinking that his own campaigns alone could bring his city a conclusive victory. He would need support by sea to overland or overland by the Alps, and it was all important that the security of the empire in Spain should be preserved. When Hannibal moved south, Fabius followed him, keeping his men in the foothills of the Apennines, whence he could send out raiding parties to cut off foragers and to harass the enemy's flanks. He made it clear from the start he would avoid any pitched battle, and whenever Hannibal seemed to offer him the opportunity, he carefully ignored it. The Carthaginian now recrossed the Apennines and made for the plain of Capua, the most celebrated in all Italy, both for its fertility and beauty. But this was not the only reason as Polybius observes why Hannibal had decided to transfer his attentions from the east coast to the southwest. It was because it is served by those seaports at which voyagers to Italy from nearly all parts of the world disembark. Hannibal hoped not only to terrorize some of the major cities into deserting the Roman alliance, but also to open sea communications with Carthage. It is very likely that at this moment the only man in the Carthaginian army who felt a tremor of concern was Hannibal himself, although he had been careful to point out to his troops that the Romans avoided battle because they were afraid, and that their spirit was broken. He was too intelligent to be deceived. Hannibal had taken the measure of his opponent, and as Livy tells us, in the silence of his heart, he was troubled by the thought that he had a general to deal with by no means like Flaminius or Sempronius. The plain, uh, the plain of Capua, into which he had led his army, was not only rich and fertile, but also difficult to access. On the west lay the Tyrrhenian Sea, and on the other sides lay lofty mountain ranges through which there were only three main passes, one from the territory of Samnium, the second to the north from Latium, and the third to the south from the country of the Harpini. Hannibal hoped that by threatening Capua, the richest city in Italy after Rome, he might draw Fabius down into the plain and engage him in a set-piece battle. He knew that there was in ancient Capua a partly hostile to Rome and seeking independence from the Latin confederation. He felt confident that if only he could destroy the Roman army, not only would Capua succeed, but also the rich seaports around the Gulf of Naples. The peoples of these coastal areas were largely of Greek stock, and he may well have hoped that they would prefer independence in the form of city-states to their present position as allies of Rome. In this he was to be disappointed, for he was to find that the mercantile citizens preferred the security that Rome afforded, while at the same time the Greeks had never forgotten their hatred of their Semitic competitors, the Phoenicians, and their descendants, the Carthaginians. Hannibal now encamped on the northern bank of the Volturnus, Volturno, and gave every impression that he intended to stay there, enjoying the richness of the land which the Numidian cavalry were sent off to harry with fire and the sword. The indignation, which had been steadily growing in the Roman camp as they saw district after district of summer Italy going up in flames, began to reach explosion point. In all their campaigns, the Roman practice had always been to seek out the enemy, to march to meet him, and then, by the combined skills of their arms and discipline, to bring him to his knees. Yet, here, in the very land of Italy itself, they found themselves, four legions of them, compelled by the orders of Fabius to trail slowly behind this Punic invader. Minucius, the master of the horse, a somewhat 
typical cavalry officer of the impetuous, fire-eating style, was leader of the descendants. The dissidents. No doubt, having heard how badly the Roman cavalry had fared against the Carthaginians in previous actions. He was eager to prove himself and his men and reestablish a proud supremacy of the cavalry type over that of the low-born, pack-carrying infantrymen. Such distinctions had been common enough in Greece and were naturally not unknown among the Romans, nor among other European armies in the centuries to come. Not only had Fabius to contend with the opposition of his own camp, but he also had his detractors in Rome, and it was even rumored that the dictator had been bought off by Hannibal, who had been canny enough to leave alone some property and land belonging to Fabius, while harrying the, idea, the area around it so as to implant this suspicion. Nevertheless, he could not be moved from his wise policy and did no more than follow Hannibal to Campania, encamping in the foothills of Mons Massacus, where he could guard the pass through which the Carthaginians had come, and yet avoid any pitched battle with the enemy. An unsuccessful cavalry engagement led by a young officer who belonged to the Actions at any cost school was turned into a route by the Numidians. This proved the wisdom of Fabius's tactics, even if the lesson was not fully absorbed by all under his command. Fabius had in fact acted with extreme discretion and great common sense in his approach towards Hannibal, and for once it looked as if the latter had fallen into just such a trap as he loved to set for others. Fabius had garrisoned the town of Cassilinum behind the Carthaginian army, blocked the Via Latina by strengthening the troops already there, and held the Via Appia. The pass by which Hannibal had entered the plain was now guarded by 4,000 men and was also overlooked by the greater part of Fabius's own troops from their camp on a hill in front of it. It was late summer, and Fabius knew that Hannibal would soon have to move, for the land around, although rich and fertile, provided no suitable place for winter quarters. It was reasonable to conjecture that Hannibal would retire towards the east coast. The Carthaginian army, furthermore, was encumbered with slaves and prisoners, bag and baggage, loot and provisions, and thousands of cattle. When Hannibal approached and made his camp under the hill where the Romans watched and waited, Fabius felt confident that at last he had his enemy in a position from which there was no escape. He refused the pitch battle, which he was clearly being offered, and as Polybius recounts it, thought that at least he would be able to carry away their booty without their disputing it, and possibly even to put an end to the whole campaign owing to the great advantage his position gave him. Fabius, for the first time in his long pursuit of the Carthaginian, was allowing himself a little optimism, and to quote again from Polybius, he was in fact entirely occupied in considering at what point and how he should avail himself of local conditions, and with what troops he should attack, and from which direction. His offer of battle having been ignored, Hannibal was not the man to waste any time, nor allow the Roman a chance to complete his dispositions and attack according to a careful plan of action. He summoned his commander, Hasdrubal, and ordered him to get together as many faggots and made-up firebrands as possible and drive some 2,000 head of cattle to the front of the army. Before the night came down, he pointed out to Hasdrubal a rise in the ground above the pass through which he intended to lead the army, and told them to detail 
off sufficient army servants to manage a carefully coordinated cattle drive. The wooden torches were bound to the horns of the cattle, and then after dark they were driven up the ridge which lay above the pass on the far side from the bulk of the Roman army. Hannibal sent some of his invaluable pikemen to accompany this strange task force, and then, having ensured that his forces had all eaten and were ready for a night march, waited for the execution of his orders. As soon as the cattle were up on the higher ground, he took the lead at the head of his heavily armed, heavily armed troops, putting the cavalry behind, then the captured cattle, and placing the Celts in the rear guard, together with his reliable Spanish troops. Suddenly the slope began to twinkle with lights, and the silence was broken by the cries of men as they shepherded the beast up and along the ridge. With firebrands burning on their horns, the cattle ran wildly through the night in front of their herdsmen. Hannibal gave the order for his army to move forward and begin their march. The Roman troops, guarding the head of the pass, saw the lights advancing over the ridge, above them, and naturally thought they were being outflanked. Despite the orders of Fabius, that no one should, on any account, attempt to make a move against the Carthaginians, they set out to meet the threat. As soon as they saw the lights advancing up the slope, thinking that Hannibal was passing on rapidly in that direction, they left the narrow part of the pass and advanced to the hill to meet the enemy. But when they got near the oxen, they were entirely puzzled by the lights, fancying that they were about to encounter something much more formidable than the reality. The moving army that the Romans expected turned out to be no more than cattle, their drovers escaping into the night in the confusion, as they blundered about along the scrub-covered hill, seeking for a real enemy. The pikemen rose up amongst them. Out of the dark, out of the rough, and the boulders, the formidable Carthaginians, wielding the pikes that, as had already been shown, outmatched the legionaries' sword in individual combat, moved in to kill. Fabius and his staff, roused by the noise and the moving lights on the slope, were uncertain what to make of the whole issue. But of one thing Fabius was sure. He would not be drawn into any form of action until daylight, when he could see for himself exactly what was required. He too, who had seemed to have eclipsed his predecessors by avoiding the traps set by the wily Carthaginian, had in his turn been tricked and deluded. He had set a snare for Hannibal, and had been taken in by an aspect of it that he had never envisaged. Hannibal had taken the measure of his cautious and wily opponent, and rightly presumed that the Roman dictator would never make a move during the night. He had also accurately conjectured that the troops who were guarding the head of the pass would never allow themselves to be outflanked by what they had they would reckon to be the passage of the Carthaginian army. Whereas, before he had allowed the impetuous natures of Sempronius and Flaminius to lead them into situations from which there was no escape, he had calculated on Fabius' caution and arranged for it to work against him. While the main body of the Romans stayed in their camp, the army of Hannibal marched out in silence through the darkness. With the light of day, the Romans looked down and saw how they had been deceived. No Carthaginian army lay encamped at their feet. Before they could fully appreciate what had happened, Hannibal sent back some of his Spaniards to give assistance to the troops who had been engaged in the night operation. A sharp clash developed on the slopes where those weapons of deception, the long horn cattle, were now grazing. The Spaniards and the lightly armed pikemen were more than a match for the heavy legionaries on the awkward terrain. 
and after killing about 1,000 Romans, made their escape and joined up with Hannibal's rear guard. The invading army, with its swollen baggage train, its cattle, and its prisoners, passed on in confidence. Fourteen. The Divided Command Hannibal's successful evasion of the trap set for him by Fabius had solved his immediate problems, but had not affected the long-term issue. The Roman army still remained intact and undefeated. This was clear enough to the Carthaginian, and clear enough also to Fabius, if not to his men and his officers. To most of the army, and to most Romans remote from the battle area, Hannibal's escape was yet another example of the failure of the dictator's policy. Hannibal now proceeded in a leisurely manner up the valley of the Volturnus as far as Venafrum, whence he appeared to threaten the eastern approaches to Rome. He hoped, no doubt, to induce Fabius to make some explicit move. When nothing was forthcoming, he moved into Samnium, across the Apennines to Solmo, plundering the land as he went, and finally storming Geronium, a rich grain depot where he established a fortified camp. Yet, in a year which so far had been one of the unequivocal success one of unequivocal success hannibal had not achieved what he had set out to do despite the fact that in military terms he had clearly demonstrated to the romans and their allies that italy was open to him to ruin and ravage as he would and Despite his proven superiority in arms and generalship over the Romans, not a single town had come over to the Carthaginian cause. The Roman confederacy remained as solid as a rock. Fabius, is true to his principles, had done no more than follow Hannibal across the Apennines into Apulia, and had camped not far away from the Carthaginian base at Geronium. His strategy remained the same, to cut off stragglers, harass the enemy's foraging parties, but to avoid action on the battlefield. In the autumn of that year, he was recalled to Rome, officially to attend to some religious duties incumbent on him as dictator, but probably also to face the critics of his military policy. Before he left, he is said to have enjoined Minucius and the other senior officers on no account to enter into any major action. Marcus Minucius Rufus, the master of the horse, although as eager to get to grips with the enemy as some of his predecessors, was an able soldier and well capable of seeing the advantages of Fabius's methods. He decided, however, to improve upon them, and having noticed that Hannibal and his men had grown casual through contempt of the Romans, took advantage of their relaxed foraging methods. Observing that something like two-thirds of Hannibal's forces were scattered throughout the countryside, and only one-third left behind in their base at Geronium, he sent out his cavalry and light troops to attack the foraging parties. A great many of the plunderers were killed, and Minucius was sufficiently emboldened to make a direct attack on the Carthaginian camp itself. For the first time since he had entered Italy, Hannibal found himself in an embarrassing and disadvantageous position, from which he was only extricated by the return of a large party led by his commander, Hasdrubal. If Hannibal had learned a lesson, more caution and less confidence, Minucius could rightly feel 
that he had given the Carthaginian a taste of his own medicine. The news of this victory, for such it seemed to be, was rapidly relayed to Rome, where it had the desired effect. It was the first success that the Romans and their allies had had since the beginning of the war, and it appeared to show that an aggressive policy, when conducted with intelligence, such as show by Minucius, would pay dividends where the shaming, hesitant tactics of Fabius allowed the land to be devastated. Romans of all classes seem to have felt that they had endured as much contempt from these invaders as could be tolerated, and the news of Minucius's victory inspired them with fresh hope. By an unprecedented decision, it was agreed at a meeting of the people that Minucius should have equal powers with Fabius. This division of the dictatorship completely nullified its whole concept, and in effect, as least when it came to the direction of the army, reduced Fabius and Minucius to the same situation as if they had been two consuls. However, since the dictatorship was divided, this meant that there was an option open for each man to take two legions under his sole command, or to act as if they had been consuls, with each man in command of all four legions on alternate days. The latter was refused by Minucius, with the result that when Fabius returned from Rome in the autumn of 217 BC, there arose the absurd position of two dictators in command of two divided Roman armies, and both men were of different persuasions as to the conduct of war. It cannot have taken long for Hannibal to have found out what had happened, if only from the fact that the two halves of the Roman army were now in separate camps. Such a situation was made for him to exploit, and he did not waste time in deciding on a course of action. His experience throughout the summer had taught him that Fabius was not to be drawn, while his recent encounter with Minucius had shown him that the latter, even if able enough, was capable of being lured into an attack. He proceeded then to lay an ambush very similar in style to that which had been so successful at the Trebia, and using once again his assessment of his opponent's character to make this factor work for him, as well as the lie of the land itself. Polybius tells the story. There was an eminence between his own camp and that of Minucius capable of being used against either of them, and this he decided to occupy. The ground round the hill was treeless, but had many irregularities, and hollows of every description in it, and he sent out at night to the most suitable position for ambuscade, five hundred horses and about five thousand light-armed and other infantry in order that they should not be observed in the early morning by the romans who were going out to forage he occupied the hill with his light armed troops as soon as it was daybreak minucius seeing this and thinking it a favorable chance set out at once his light infantry with orders to engage the enemy and dispute the position Eager to drive what he imagined to be Hannibal's advance guard from the hill and deny it to him, Minucius sent forward his cavalry, then himself advanced with his two legions. All the attention of the Romans was entirely fixed upon the hill where the preliminary battle was taking place. In order to convince the Romans that this was the main object of his interest, Hannibal kept sending forward reinforcements to assist his men who were holding the position against the Roman attack. The Roman light forces were gradually driven back by the weight of the Carthaginians, and as they retreated, fell foul of the legions, advancing to support them and threw them into confusion. Now was the moment, and the signal was given. Hannibal's concealed troops rose up from all directions and fell upon the legions in the rear, 
The whole of Minucius's army was now in a perilous position. Another trebia was imminent. They were saved only by the action of Fabius. For once, the Delaire delayed no longer, and brought his own two legions to the rescue. Hannibal, seeing the fresh legions advancing, wisely abandoned the pursuit of Minucius' panic-stricken army, and withdrew his own men. His and withdrew his own men. The Romans had lost many of their light troops, and even more of their best legionaries. It was a lesson that Minucius took to heart. He not only apologized to Fabius while thanking him for his rescue, but also admitted that the whole idea of the two dictators and the division of the army was wrong. He handed over his part of the command to Fabius, and willingly relegated himself to his former position of master of the horse. The two separate Roman camps were broken up, and the army once more composed itself into a single strong unit with one base, everyone acknowledging that Fabius was rightfully the sole leader, and that his strategy had all along been correct. Hannibal was not slow to realize that this deliberate choice by the Romans of a new unity boded ill for his campaign. The willingness of the defeated troops and their commander to accept the leadership of Fabius, whom he had learned to respect over those summer months, showed a new spirit. Then, for the first time, comments Livy, they realized that they were fighting with Romans and in Italy. During the campaign of the past year, and ever since the engagement at the Ticinus the year before, they had grown to despise both the Roman soldiers and their generals, but already there was evidence of change, and Hannibal is said to have remarked that he was returning from the field, that at last the clouds which had been long hanging about the mountain tops had broken in a storm of rain. Hannibal now had a stockade erected around the hill and linking his position up by trenches with the camp at Geronium, settled down for the winter. Until the spring of 216 BC, the two armies laid opposite one another, and the months went by without any further real action. Fabius's term of office as dictator came to an end, and until the election of new consuls in the following year, Servilius, who had commanded the legions at Ariminum, and Marcus Attilius Regulus, who had succeeded Flaminius on his death at Trasimene, held the command. Hannibal had much to think about. The year which had began so well for him, and during which he had nothing but success over the Romans, was not entirely happy for the Carthaginians. Things had not gone well in Spain. There had been a revolt among the Celtiberians. The Romans were consolidating their hold over the northern part of the country, and his brother Hasdrubal had withdrawn south of the Ebro for the winter. Everywhere at sea, the power of the Roman fleet had shown that the control of the Mediterranean still remained firmly in their hands. He had not been able to take advantage of his victory at Tresamine by attacking the Roman capital, and not a single ally had come over to him. No reinforcements had reached him from Carthage, and, as Carthaginian spies within the city must have sent word, seaports like Neapolis had declared their allegiance to Rome to be unshaken. O'Connor Morris, in Hannibal, soldier statesman, patriot, has summed up the position at the end of the year. Quote, and if Rome had been defeated by a great captain, her worst resources for war were still enormous. She had already summoned eight double legions to the field, the number of men in the ranks being largely increased for the campaign of the coming year. She was about to oppose 90,000 men to Hannibal, who had not more than 50,000, three-fourths of them being perhaps Gauls, and had prepared an army to march into northern Italy to prevent the Gauls from assisting their terrible enemy. Her stern national spirit, too, was as bold as ever, 
she sent threats to the court of Macedon and to the Illyrian tribes, warning them that they had better remain quiescent and with admirable wisdom. She refused gifts of money offered by Hiero, her vassal king in Sicily, and by several of the allied Italian states, accepting, however, their aid for the war. End of quote. The only news that may have inspired Hannibal with confidence was that the Romans did not intend to re-elect a dictator. They were reverting to the consular system. The names and the histories of the two new consuls may also have given him cause to feel that his enemies were repeating their old mistake. One was a partisan of the aristocracy, and the other was a known demagogue. The former was Lucius Aemilius Paulus, member of a celebrated patrician family, who had held the office of consul in 219 BC and who had a good military record. He was known to be a staunch adherent of the aristocracy and had been voted into office by them for this second time in order to counterbalance the influence of his fellow consul Gaius Torrentius Varro. Two men more dissimilar could not have been chosen. Varro was a plebeian of ultra-democratic opinions who had managed to get voted into office by the people for his defamatory attacks on Fabius, the dictator. His arguments and those of his supporters will be familiar to those who have observed the pattern of similar politicians in later centuries. The noble had been seeking war for many years, and it was they who had brought Hannibal into Italy. It was their machinations, too, that were spinning out of war when it might be brought to a victorious conclusion. The consuls had employed the arts of Fabius to prolong the war, when they could have ended it. The nobles had all made a compact to the effect, nor could the people see an end to the war until they had elected a true plebeian, a new man to the consulship. Hannibal would have been familiar with the nature of the two consuls, for he had his informants in Rome. Livy mentions one Carthaginian spy who was caught and had his hands cut off. He could only hope for some almost inevitable division of opinion between the patrician and the plebeian, something of which he could take advantage in order to force upon the Romans, the battle that Fabius, the dictator, had denied him. Despite his triumphant record in Italy, over the past two campaigning seasons, Hannibal badly needed a victory. He needed a victory so decisive that the allies of Rome would at last begin to break away from her.